So what I wanted to talk to you about was just tell you a little bit about myself first. I taught myself how to lucid dream a long time ago, back when I was a junior in high school. Uh, that was in 1975. So I've been a lucid dreamer for more than 40 years. And what was interesting, I taught myself a simple technique to become lucidly aware uh, that I share in my books. What was interesting, though, at that time, the scientific evidence for lucid dreaming wasn't available. It hadn't even happened yet. And so it wasn't until 1980, 1981 that the scientific evidence came out and I could begin to talk with my friends about lucid dreaming um, and, and uh, share, share my enthusiasm with them. But also uh, what it helped me at that time was just to learn about lucid dreaming. I kind of had a five years head start on everyone and it helped me uh, understand a lot about the way that the lucid dreaming state works. You know, the principles of lucid dreaming that we all need to understand in order to have a long, stable, adventurous lucid dream. And so that's why about 20 years ago, my friend uh, Lucy Gillis and I began this magazine called The Lucid Dreaming Experience. We wanted to hear from other lucid dreamers around the world about what they were experiencing. So in this magazine, if you've never checked it out, you can always go to luciddreammagazine.com. It's for free, so there's nothing you need to buy. Just uh, sign up if you want to, or just keep checking the World of Lucid Dreaming Facebook page. And, and we'll put each issue there. But in each issue, what we do is uh, first, um, I'll interview a lucid dreamer, oftentimes a very experienced lucid dreamer, or in this case, this issue, a unique lucid dreamer. Then we'll have five or six articles that people submit about lucid dreaming, sometimes with different techniques that they've used that have helped them. Sometimes uh, people who want to explore certain topics in lucid dreaming. And then the final 10 pages is reader submitted lucid dreams. People like yourself who just want to share an interesting lucid dream they had, the very first lucid dream they had, or, or just whatever uh, is happening in their lucid dreaming life. And what's always fun when you read the Lucid Dreaming Experience magazine is you realize that a lot of people are approaching lucid dreaming from their own perspective. Um, some people are really adventurous. Other people are really experimental and analytical. Other people are focusing on, on topics that you've probably never thought of. And that, that's one thing I love about the lucid dreaming experience. It just makes me think of a lot of new ideas that I've never thought about before. So sometimes I'll read the magazine and somebody's experience and I'll think, oh, that's impossible. You can't do that. Or can you? And within a week or two, I'll have a lucid dream where I'm trying to do the very same exact thing. So I think it helps us keep our interest in lucid dreaming alive and also shows us the depth and breadth and vastness of lucid dreams. So what I wanted to share at the start of this uh, conversation it's just uh, 10 or 15 minutes here about my interview with a young woman, uh, Jana Heinke. She uh, was born in Finland, but what's unique in her case, she was born blind. She's never had the capacity to see. And so what's interesting here is that she became a lucid dreamer and uh, I just thought this is so interesting because most of us, when we think about lucid dreaming, we focus on the visual cues. You know, we, we see something impossible and, you know, um, we see our hands and we have seven fingers and we go, oh, this, that's too weird. This is a dream. But here we have a blind lucid dreamer who is becoming lucidly aware. And so in the interview, my first question to her was, can you remember your first lucid dream? What happened? And she replied, it was in January 2022. I was lying next in my bed next to my husband. Suddenly, my blanket started to move. It felt like it was swelling and moving. Too much stress, I thought. Then for some reason, I raised my hand up and found a kind of wooden stick hanging above our bed. It was about as thick as a baguette 
and easy to hold on to. Now I was even more sure I must be somehow out of my mind. However, I took hold of the stick and suddenly I was flying, first in our bedroom, then in the house. I was afraid, but still somehow enjoyed that first lucid dream experience. So that's how she became lucidly aware. It was not that she saw something, she felt like the blankets were moving on her bed, that they were swelling and moving around. And that sort of situation helped clue her in to, hey, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. And so Stephen LaBerge would probably talk about that as, as kind of uh, an experiential cue. I, I know sometimes in my lucid dreams, I'm walking down a sidewalk. I'll come up to a mud puddle and... I'm in a regular dream now, and I'm come up to the mud puddle, and I decide to jump across it, but I'll glide for 10 or 15 feet. And then it occurs to me, wait, what, what am I doing gliding? Oh, this is a dream. And so sometimes the experience that we have sometimes can clue us in that, hey, this is a dream. So in Jonna's case, what happened next is she could barely imagine this experience. And so she got on Facebook and started asking some of her friends, you know, have you ever had this kind of strange experience? And they told her that she was probably having lucid dreams. And so she began to investigate that. And she found uh, my second book, uh, the Finnish version that I co-authored with Anna Riamaki in Helsinki. And she began to read it and began to have lucid dreams. She, she said that the, the great thing about it was that at the very beginning, she might have one or two lucid dreams a month. But then as she started to read up on them and realize some of the techniques and become more comfortable with the idea, she began to have lucid dreams about twice a week. And she says she has them about twice a week and, and unless she's under a lot of stress. So the great thing about it, she said, was that it was fun in lucid dreams to realize that not only could you be the director of the activity, but you could also be the star in your own lucid dream if you wanted to do that. So I asked her some other questions like, what do you like about lucid dreaming? She writes, as a blind person, I felt surprised that I can do things in lucid dreams like fly, ride a motorbike, spring into a swimming pool and even breathe under the water. Flying, whether in our house or in some kind of place or dimension that I don't really understand, is fascinating. The way the flying device comes to me, making me know I am lucid dreaming, is just fantastic. And what she means there again is oftentimes in her lucid dreams, if she'll reach up, there'll be something in the air above her, which she calls the flying stick, that will take her around and move her. Now, now, what I find interesting about that, it happened in the very first lucid dream that she ever had. So it's not like her conscious mind created it, but somehow her unconscious mind created it. And when you think about blind people, oftentimes blind people learn to get down a city street by having a, uh, a walking cane or a tapping cane that they can tap and kind of hear and feel the vibra vibration of things and kind of maneuver down the sidewalk and stay on the sidewalk uh, by using that cane. And so it's interesting here that in her very first lucid dream, her unconscious provides for her basically the equivalent of a cane or a walking stick, but of course it's above her. And this stick, however, allows her to fly. And I, I thought, boy, that's really just truly amazing. She went on to say one thing she liked about lucid dreaming. Since last summer, I've been meeting interesting people in my lucid dreams. Mostly a small, about a three foot tall, very cheerful, friendly, laughing woman who talks with a Mickey Mouse voice. So imagine that what she's finding in many of her lucid dreams, there's one dream figure there who she can distinguish because it has a funny a funny Mickey Mouse voice. And she said that she talked so much in her lucid dreams that she was sure that she was waking up her husband laying in bed, but he would tell her in the morning, no, you hadn't said anything. So 
I'm just going to go on with this uh, interview a little bit just to get to a little bit more about this. So, so one time um, she decided to ask this woman with the Mickey Mouse voice, who are you? And why are you here? And she said, yes, I asked, who are you? And she told me her name is Ali. Unfortunately, I haven't asked her yet where she comes from and why. I will do that as soon as I meet her again. And then I put in the into the Google Translate, Ali, A-I-L-I, and in Finnish, that means, that name means bright, shining light, or holy and blessed. And so it's interesting that the dream figure produced this name, that it that's what it's named. And it, she goes on a couple of times, I have asked, who is driving the flying device? I received an answer only once. A female, a female voice told me that it wouldn't matter. I then asked where the device is coming from. The answer is from the beginning. And the voice said, Alkuk Adalta in Finnish, uh, which has that meaning from the beginning. Sounds a bit crazy, I know, but that's what she said. Also, it was interesting too that she mentioned that this flying stick has changed over the course of her lucid dreaming. She said, uh, she writes, the device is in almost all of my lucid dreams. When becoming lucid, I automatically raise my hands and find the device. At the beginning, January of 22, it was a wooden stick as thick as a baguette. Today, the stick can be anything possible. It could be made of metal, made of gum, covered with hair, covered with velvet, and sometimes has grips on it or rings to hold on to. He writes, I'm a big lady who can't be lifted off the bed with a small stick. I try to tell myself that in lucid dreams, my weight doesn't matter. As soon as I'm out of the bed in my lucid dreams, mostly, I fly successfully. Sometimes the stick has buttons, which I push, hoping that they will turn gravity off. The biggest problem with the device is that I don't trust it. I'm sure I'm too heavy. And although I'm having a lucid dream, it seems like the gravity is stronger. I'm now trying to find some additional techniques in order to be able to fly. So anyway, I just wanted to give you kind of that introductory viewpoint of another person's experience in lucid dreaming. They've been blind since birth, and they have been able to have lucid dreams here in the last year and a half. And it's interesting how that even though they can't look around and visually see anything other than just the most bright light in darkness, most of the time they're in darkness, unless there's some bright light. He did notice also that in this interview that occasionally sometimes in her lucid dreams, it would begin because she would start seeing a flickering light. And for her as a blind person, that's very unusual. And then that clues her in that, oh, maybe I'm dreaming. And then she'll reach up. And if she feels the flying stick, then she'll grab that and know that she's having a lucid dream. But anyway, I just wanted to share that as just one example. Again, you can go to luciddreammagazine.com. You can just click on this issue, read the articles. Of course, we have a lot of uh, lucid dreams over the last 20 years and a lot of past issues that you can read as well. And there in the Lucid Dreaming Experience magazine, we also we also uh, uh, have special issues. Sometimes uh, we'll discuss something like fear in lucid dreams and how you resolve that. Or we'll talk about other aspects of lucid dreaming that people like to get into.